morning. SJC 11962, Commonwealth v. Carlos G. Stevenson. Good morning, Ms. Steven oh, good morning, Ms. Sweeney. Good morning, may it please the court. Elizabeth Sweeney on behalf of the Commonwealth. I'd like to acknowledge the amicus briefs written by Kevin Curtin on behalf of the district attorneys and Wendy Murphy for the Women and Children's Law Center. There's no question here that there was probable cause to support the indictments. And moreover, there is nothing misleading or improper about this grand jury presentation. <coughs> the singular decision to use hearsay evidence, the testimony in this case of the main investigating officer, is not the extraordinary circumstance that this court envisioned in the Commonwealth v. St. Pierre admonition. Well, you know, if you look at, it's certainly, I think it meets the standard of the first sort of set of circumstances that uh, Justice Kaplan was talking about, um, in that uh, it meets the standard, which he thought was kind of low, but nonetheless, it meets the standard that, um, uh, comparable to that which applies in testing the basis of arrest and search warrants, and the standard is modest. So I, I don't think there's the question, but he goes on to say, um, it is a second way in which it can be uh, um, extraordinary, which is that he says that the rule of certain cases broadly entitled a defendant in aid of trial preparation to secure dis discovery from the Commonwealth of relevant grand jury minutes and statements of prosecution witnesses. These statements are particularly important when the witnesses will not speak with defense counsel, but a prosecutor can subvert the discovery by omitting probable cause proceedings of offering only hearsay materials and those that have double removed the grand jury and refraining from memorializing the statements of important witnesses. So he puts those together and says, well, that can be enough. So don't we have some of that here? We don't have any we, recording we, of witness statements. We don't have any recording of witness statements, And correct. we don't have a probable cause hearing. There was no probable cause hearing. Uh, and we don't have anything other than uh, the police officer's testimony. Correct. Um, which was not, in fact, on all fours with what the police report said. It's my understanding and my position that it was on all fours with what the police report did say. And the grand jury... Well, what about with the neighbor? When the jury, well, Didn't the grand jury ask about whether the neighbor was on vacation? And he answered very confidently, yes, they were on vacation then. No, he, he said it, he didn't say, yes, they were on vacation. He said it was his understanding or his belief that they said that they probably were, they believed that they were on vacation. There was some hesitancy of the, the neighbor when they did talk about if they're on vacation, and he reiterated that in his testimony to the grand jury and the defense attorney in their brief in this case did address that. But the issue of what you're, you're getting at is, is that there was nothing misleading here with the grand jury presentation. He didn't say it had to be misleading. He didn't say that. that that's not what uh, St. Pierre said, and I, I read it to you because I didn't say anything there about misleading. It said about whether or not um, the prosecutor uh, by not memorializing anything, basically, uh, is, uh, is in fact sort of subverting the, the function of the grand jury. The function of the grand jury is to determine if there is probable cause and if there's a named individual. The function is not to, as this judge put it, size up the victim or necessarily memorialize their statement. And if the grand jury had a problem with how we presented our case with the investigating officer, and they were aware at all times that this was a hearsay case, by all means, issue a no bill or ask for her to come in. Do they even know that they can do that? I mean, maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we should be giving uh, instructions to the grand jury about what their powers are. The grand jury is instructed of what their powers are. They're, they're instructed that they can call witnesses. They're they instructed that they're an investigatory body. They can in conduct their own investigations. They ins what are the instructions that are given to the grand jury in these circumstances? They're instructed, the grand jury is instructed that if they have a question, they can ask the, the witness. They can call witnesses. They can they're summon they can subpoena witnesses. witnesses. They're the told grand they jury has a very broad... Are they told that? Yes. They are? Yes. It, can I, uh, as a procedural matter, um, my memory from... Uh, way past, is that the instructions to the grand jury, the, the general, I mean, they are general instructions at the at the beginning of the term. Exactly, right? when they're sworn in, they're given. All their powers. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, it's not like every case gets yes. one. Right? And in this case, the record reflects that they were aware of what they could do. They asked um, very, very pointed <coughs> questions in this case from pages, I believe it's 36 to 
um, 57, they asked over 20 pages of questions to this investigating officer, including, is this all the evidence we have? Is there any other evidence? They're asking about her, her physical and her emotional issues. And when the, um, when the school had this report or this, this survey about sexual assault, why didn't anybody in Martha's Vineyard do this, anything about this in 2009? Why did it take so long? So they were aware that this was a hearsay case and they asked very direct questions to this witness. And the judge found in his opinion, in his findings of fact, that the grand jury is a, a rubber stamp or you can indict a ham sandwich. But in this case, the prosecutor had to work for it with those 20 pages of questions from the very inquisitive grand jurors in this case. And they did ask, and the record reflects, is, is this all the evidence we have? Did, so they were aware. Um, in terms of the actual vote for the indictment, is the prosecutor in the room, or does the prosecutor leave the room? How, how I does believe in this case the prosecutor was not in the room for the for the vote. But the record we don't have that in front of us, and the, that wouldn't have been recorded. And do do the I can't remember this either. Do the um, assuming that to be the case, do the deliberations, if you will, of the grand jurors before the vote, does that get recorded by the... Um, no, no, it's a secret, secret right, investigation. No, I just didn't know if that was part yeah. of what the minutes are. No, 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 I would love to know that, but okay. <laughs> unfortunately we okay. don't have that here. Um, no, they, that was, it was secret. We don't know what they talked about. We don't know how long they took. That's not in the record. But we do know that they asked 21 pages of questions of this officer, including, you know, is this all we have, this delayed disclosure of this young female from 9 to... 13 is when she was assaulted to, to then. Now, is, is, is there a reason why no SANE interview was done here? It is um, the policy of um, children's advocacy centers. They all, across Massachusetts, they all have different um, ways they deal with that. And you would interview a victim of a, chi a child victim, do a SANE interview, bring them down to Children's Cove, our CAC, um, if, they're, if they're a child. But here, because it was a 23-year-old woman, uh, you would not do a SANE interview in that case. It's an investigatory procedure. So that's part of the general policies about? Uh, general policy, of uh, we have a children's cove is what it's called, our CAC down on there, a separate body from the DA's office that handles that. But you wouldn't bring a 23-year-old down to the children's uh, cove. Uh, my, I guess my question is, is that the, the district attorney's policy or is that the children's cove's policy? That's the children's cove's policy. They're separate, they're two separate entities. And they wouldn't, and we do they wouldn't together, interview they just wouldn't use the same procedure for somebody who was 23? Children's Cove wouldn't interview a 23-year-old. That would be handled by the police department because arguably there wouldn't be any child or juvenile issues that Children's Cove would be addressing with that You mean adult. like removal from the home? Sorry? Like such a, you know, children's issues such as removal from the home? Uh, Children's Cove or inter a sane interview for a child would be you'd bring them down to a room with a two-way screen and the um, trained, trained interviewers. forensic in, uh, interviewer would ask a child, you know, to get at what happened because of the difficulty of dealing with the child and disclosing that type of stuff. But here we did not have that. Um, she was a 23-year-old adult when she made this disclosure because the defendant explicitly stated to her, uh, as the grand jury heard, if you tell anybody, I'll kill your cat and run over your parents. And he still to this day lives next door to her. So there was this significant issue um, in, in that delay. She didn't disclose it. Would it uh, be a different case if the person who had testified before the grand jury was not the investigator of the case, but somebody who knew nothing about the case and was just handed the reports, as was in St. Pierre? That would be an absolutely different case. If that happened, I probably would not be standing here defending this case. What happened in St. <coughs> Pierre was a random officer was available hey, can you come here and testify about this case? We have to indict it, hand them a report, and then ask them questions. And in that case, the grand jury, there's a significant issue about them being misled because this individual doesn't have um, personal knowledge of the investigation. And the concern, what I was getting at the beginning of my argument about misleading, is, is not present here when it's the direct investigating officer. Now, as to that point, uh, if this were not a superior court case, not an indictment, but a case that was a sexual abuse case that was going to remain within the jurisdiction of the district courts, um, it's my understanding that th a lot of police departments have, quote, court officers uh, who read from police reports and that they have nothing to do with the investigation. Uh, and precisely this sort of thing could happen in the application for a complaint in the district court. Is, is your answer the same in those circumstances? Um, it, 
it could happen. I've, to be honest, I've never heard of that specific issue in our county, but um, again, why would you bring, or I've never heard of a district court case bringing a victim in to issue a complaint and have her testify before the court to, to have that issued other than a clerk magistrate hearing. That it's very different from what we have here. Um, in, in well, these why is it different? Why, uh, if there were a child who was a sexual assault victim, should the child, why should the child have to testify before a clerk magistrate? The child should should not have to testify before a clerk magistrate. That just this court has recognized consistently the the repeated um, exposure of an individual who's been sexually assaulted to the criminal justice system, and how traumatic that is. And I cited the uh, Commonwealth v. Durling. The court recognized it, that in that case, as in here, and the judge in his decision um, completely ignored that and set us back, in my opinion, uh, several years to Old English common law of hue and cry. For example, if this woman, if this she was really raped, he, um, bring her before the grand jury, so as he put it, they could, on transcript page nine, they could size her up. But this, haven't we, in our cases, repeatedly said we have a preference for direct testimony? There and is a, that, And in the cases that you cite are in different contexts than a grand jury where there's no cross-examination, the defendant is not present. So it's a different type of situation than one where the victim would be or the complainant would be uh, subject to cross-examination or in the presence of uh, you know, the person that she says uh, attacked her. It's a different setting. I, I don't think that our cases have really uh, you know, uh, explored these differences in the way that you're suggesting. There is um, a preference for direct testimony before grand juries, and the standard, as, I, as you stated, is extraordinary circumstances. In this case, um, the only case that this court has addressed involving sexual assault and hearsay would be Commonwealth v. Washington W., a 2012 case um, where the uh, indictments were um, overturned for reasons other than the grand jury, but they heard hearsay testimony. The victim did not testify. May I yeah. ask you whether any of the questions from the jurors involved uh, whether the complaining witness was reluctant to testify. Uh, I didn't read the transcript of the questions. I don't even know if it's in the record, but it strikes me that um, maybe there's an <coughs> element of misleading there if the jurors are asking about why, why aren't we seeing the complaining witness here, did, did any of them want to know about that? No, they did not ask why is she not here. Um, they heard about her, her bulimia, her nightmares, the fact that she's a cutter, she's suicidal, she has alcohol and drug dependence based off of you know, these instances, but they did not ask why is she not here. They asked, is this all the evidence that we have, which, which I took to just them judging the, the credibility of the officer, the strength of the case. And th they did that for 21 pages of questions. They asked the officer up and down all different questions about the case. They were very involved, but they never asked why is she not here? And if they did ask to see her, or if they did an ask that question, we would have answered it appropriately. And if they want to see her, brought her in. Was the police report before the grand jury? The police report was not before the grand jury, no. Okay. So they couldn't see whether or not the um, officer's testimony matched up with the police report? They could not see whether or not it matched up. Is there any reason why the police report wasn't put before the grand jury? Um, I, I don't see why we would They ask any questions about they the didn't, police report? They didn't ask about the police report. No, they asked about the, the survey um, the sexual assault 2009 survey, survey in from Martha's high school. Vineyard. Yeah, they, and and they saw they, that. Wasn't that an exhibit before them? Yes. Yeah, they saw that. They saw um, what she attributed to her statements, and they heard from the investigating officer about all the different people he spoke with, the neighbors to corroborate that there was this couch that the defendant raped her on, that they were on. They believed that they were on vacation in the fall of 2003. She did have a cat. They, he confirmed the defendant did drive a truck during the time period where he said, "If you tell anybody, I'll." Um, run over your cat and kill your parents. And there was significant investigation. It wasn't just like he talked to the victim and went before the grand jury. He spoke with the individuals that he had to and presented that. But um, not the defendant's wife or children. He did not talk to the defendant's wife or children. Again, there was issues about um, whether or not the defendant's wife were having marital problems and the children during the time period were, were young. I believe that he said that they were still in car seats during the time period of this investigation when she was babysitting them. So <coughs> not to defend his 
his actions or explain why he would investigate in one way or another because I don't know. But I don't think speaking to individuals who are toddlers when you're abusing a young girl is necessarily going to bring out any information to support the case. Yeah. I mean, it is difficult when you've got a case that's 14 years old for people's memories to be particularly accurate in any it's, event. It's difficult, but the grand jury was aware of that. There was nothing, nothing misleading. They knew it was a delayed disclosure, and they knew what the, uh, the steps that the officer took mm -hmm. in this case. If there are no further questions, I rest on my brief. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Ms. Basil. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, my name is Janice Basil and I represent Carlos Stevenson. Um, for 37 years since St. Pierre, this court has warned repeatedly that sound policy dictates a preference for the use of direct testimony before grand juries. A preference may be one thing, but I'm not aware of us dismissing a case, a serious That's criminal case. That's correct. Based and on the testimony of the investigating police officer. That's correct. And, and because there has not been a dismissal, the district attorneys over time have taken that warning to mean we can do it. We they can. can. We can. And, uh, and it has just, I have watched it over the course of my career become the standard operating procedure. And it is my position this court could decide this case narrowly as the according to what the trial court did, that the court did not abuse his discretion in dismissing the charges, and there are unique and extraordinary circumstances in this case that Can warrant, we, yes. You've got the investigating officer in incredibly detailed uh, investigation, correct. interview reports, et cetera. Uh, yes, What you are the do. extraordinary circumstances? I don't see any You have an allegation that's over 14 years old. There is no medical or physical corroboration. There are no additional precipient witnesses. There's no confession by the defendant. The grand jury is never told. Those are extraordinary circumstances? Uh, I thought extraordinary the, circumstances were part of the prosecution's attempt to, to mislead or deceive. I would, or tell you, I would say that the police officer in this case added his own spin to the facts without question. He added this idea that the defendant got a thrill out of uh, allegedly molesting this girl when his family was around. He added his own spin that the parents were finally relieved to get to the root cause of her problems. He added a spin that the neighbors were most definitely away when the police report was nowhere near as definite as that. I would also say that the other half of St. Pierre and what's important here is there was no recorded uh, statement by the complaining witness. And as Justice Lank said, part of St. Pierre is this issue of tactically and quite frankly cynically using the grand jury to uh, make sure that the defendant really doesn't have. You have no evidence of that? That the district attorney cynically used the grand jury to attorney. ensure no evidence? You've got a detailed police report. Victim stated, victim stated, victim stated, victim stated, victim stated, victim described, victim. This is a detailed report of what she told the officer. Yes, but here's, here is, there are two things about this. First of all, at the hearing, which you have the transcript before, the district attorney admitted it never even occurred to her to ask the witness if she was available. And the witness had appeared in court before and lived on the island. The second part of this is that. Well, well, well th that, okay, but just on that point, yep. I mean, it seems to me that, um, from my knowledge, that in sexual assault cases, that many district attorneys have a policy they are not going, as a matter of policy, are not, for the reasons that Ms. Sweeney stated, are not going to have the victim uh, come testify before the grand jury. So it's not a cynical something or other to keep the information from the grand jury. You may disagree with the policy. I, I get that. But I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that that's somehow misusing the grand jury as opposed to a good faith belief that that, in, in their opinion, is going to uh, exacerbate the victimization. Well, I, I cited in my brief and I pointed out to the court that in fact there is no research that a, a uh, complaining witness testifying in the grand jury, I'm not talking about the trial, but in a grand jury is traumatized or further traumatized. In fact, what I cited to was a study and even a um, law review article by a woman who had been a prosecutor and a rape victim that the idea of a witness testifying can give them some closure, some process control. 
I'm asking the court not to be swayed by the repeated use of, oh, the victims, we're victimizing them again. In fact, what surprised me most is when I looked up the quote that a victim feels she's been raped twice by being in court, the full, co the full quote was that victims feel they've been raped twice because of their treatment by hospitals, police officers, and district attorneys. So, that so, was the full so, quote. so if that's true, if all that is true, I take it your point would be that even children should be required to testify before no. clerk magistrates. No. I mean, if it's such a, a purge, if it's such a wonderful experience, it should happen with, with all sexual assault victims. That's not my point at all, and that is in my brief. The fact is that <coughs> in virtually every county except Barnstable County, interviews are done of children by forensic interviewers, and they are recorded. 23-year-olds? No, no, I'm talking... Justice Spina asked me about children. But, but I will say that. But I'm that talking about the, 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 uh, the, the applications for complaints right. uh, before a clerk magistrate. If, 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 why don't they, uh, re what we, it seems to me that one of the things, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, the results of, of your, uh, one of the, the logical extension of what you're arguing is to have everybody, every sexual assault victim testify before every magistrate or grand jury uh, whenever an, an indictment or a complaint is requested for a sexual abuse I offense. am not asking that about the district court. First of all, the district court uh, typically, and actually in all of my experience, except when there are show cause hearings, are done by the issuance of a police report, and usually that is attached to the application for a complaint that is often usually filled out by a police officer. So I have no issue with that. The district court carries a limited amount of penalties. So, so in this case, if... If, if the police report had been submitted to the grand jury, would that have been enough? No. Why not? Because it's the grand jury. It's a different institution. It's an institution. It, it's an accusatory body. It is also it, a It's body. not a discovery device. Well, St. Pierre talked about the idea of putting hearsay in front of the grand jury as a way to subvert discovery. It is also... But where does that come from other than St. Pierre? I've never heard of the grand jury as a discovery implement for... Defense counsel. No, but the grand jury typically, obviously, we get grand jury minutes. We didn't used to, but we do now. We get grand jury minutes. It often contains statements of witnesses, and it is discovery. I mean, that's what it's called when you are in court and you're filing huh? pretrial conferences. Ms. Basa, you're yes. doing very well, but let me sure. come to your defense just a little bit. That'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> cynical was probably not a good word for you uh, to use. I could uh, use tactical. Okay. And, you know, maybe you could just focus us on the unfairness in this particular yes. case because I can. that can be pretty compelling. The unfairness that I see in this case is this. I am at trial in order to impeach the complaining witness. I am required to use a third party, the police officer. So my, so for example, let's say that the witness testifies to something that was never before the grand jury, a new incident or something else. I then have to impeach the, call the police officer or if they're called, ask them about did the witness tell you this or the witness never said this to you. I am dependent upon the police officer's memory I am dependent on his police report. I have heard countless times uh, police officers say over and over again, well, I, I wrote as much as I could in my report. I'm only capable of taking notes as I'm capable of doing them. And the other piece to this difficulty is that if the, if the district attorney chooses not to call the police officer in their case in chief, I'm required to call the police officer in order to put this inconsistent statement in front of the grand jury, which then means, of course, that the prosecutor can then cross-examine the police officer and put in all of the highlights of their case, sort of one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, which is not something that I would want to happen. So I do see that as being unfair, and that the, in fact, what I end up sort of with impeachment is really the issue of the police officer's memory as opposed to what the witness said. So then if, if the, uh, the complainant yes. uh, did testify before the grand jury but gave an abridged version of what happened and mm -hmm. didn't go through um, the, the, with, with the precise detail as, as uh, would have occurred at trial, 
uh, you would then have grand jury minutes uh, that you could use to great purpose uh, in impeaching the victim because she didn't <coughs> testify to any number of things in the grand jury. That's correct. I would say you didn't so, so, say So this. isn't that unfair to, to, to the complainant? You, you're requiring them to, to testify not just to probable cause, but to every single detail that, that, that would have occurred at trial, that would have been presented at trial. Requiring the prosecutor to ask it first. I mean, the prosecutor puts the witness in front of the grand jury. They can ask those questions. And yes, any witness, whether it's a, whether it's a victim, whether it's a police officer, what they don't say in a prior consistent statement is something that gets cross-examined. And one that thing, is what trials are about. But not one thing you have said with respect to the to to this point, uh, has been anything other than a a discovery issue. This is not you have not addressed probable cause, which is the function of the grand jury. The grand jury has two functions. One is probable cause, and the other function is to act as a shield between the citizen and the prosecutor. And, and, that, and, and that and that shield is to provide exculp to provide uh, impeachment evidence. That shield is to provide fairness and to have the grand jury make an independent determination based on evidence before them. In the 37 years I've been a lawyer, I have never well, seen a grand juror that. bring a witness yeah, in on you, their you, own. Yeah, you said that, and, yes. and, and I asked the question before about is the another way to do this uh, to make sure that the grand jurors are properly instructed as to what their powers are so that they understand that they can do that if they want to. Now, what do you say about the way the juror, grand jurors are instructed now and, and well, whether or not, you say in 37 years you've never seen it. I've but, never seen it. Well, I, you know, I mean, that's, that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened, but, you know, but is that, but is it bec because they don't know? I mean, you know, we're very, we've had a history of our cases of really not wanting to interfere with the function of the grand jury for very good reasons. Yeah. Have you ever um, been present when a grand jury has been uh, 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 brought in when, when the selection of the grand jury process takes place? I and wouldn't be. I'm not a prosecutor. Well, it, it's a public event. It's open to no, the public. No, it's not. It's the swearing in of the grand jurors, is, I think is what Justice I, I have been there when grand juries have come in and have been asked to leave the courtroom, so I'm not aware of it being a public so uh, you, you haven't been present when a Superior Court judge instructs the grand jury at the beginning of the session? I've been asked to step outside as has everyone in the courtroom except well, court that's officers. The, do you that, know that's, what those that's instructions are? I do not know what those instructions are. And th those are not publicly available instructions? Not that I'm aware of. I, I do not know what those instructions are. And I would also say that um, certainly when the grand jurors had these questions, it would not have been very difficult for the district attorney to have said, look, if you want to hear from her, I will bring her in front of you. Can you, uh, if you were to prevail, Yes. What would be the rule that we would set that would guide prosecutors as to right. when they must call a witness before the grand jury? I had, um, I had actually asked, as you know, from my brief to both decide this narrowly and more broadly, and I did propose a rule for the court um, based on my review of sort of various states um, in dealing with this. My proposal would be that um, hearsay should not be put in front of the grand jury barring extraordinary circumstances would those circumstances put on the record in addition i would put in a number of exceptions so for example if there is a recorded interview of a, that children would not appear in front of the grand jury sane interviews would be recorded they would be played for the grand jury another exception would be <coughs> things such as dna reports or fingerprint reports you know things that are an investigating officer, usually in a murder case, for example, the uh, chief investigator will often come in and say, uh, you know, we, we uh, sent this out for DNA and it came back that it was the defendant's DNA or uh, fingerprints matched or things of that nature. Even drug certificates, although we've all run into a problem recently with drug certificates, but those are things so that in, in, in it the, doesn't seem to in, me that in they In this need case, if the witnesses. Commonwealth wanted to offer corroboration that the neighbors indeed were away when she said that uh, Mr. Stevenson brought her to the neighbor's house. They'd have to call the neighbor to testify? Well, the neighbors are not as critical to the grand jury's decision. And I don't know that they necessarily have to call the neighbors. Um, well, the I, neighbors I, that, I guess that's my concern. Is, I mean, yep. we're, you're saying the failure to do something results in dismissal. Mm -hmm. And 
How is the prosecutor going to determine what is critical? Is this purely with regard to old allegations of sexual assault, or is this a broader scope that's going to require the prosecutor to bring in 12, 14 witnesses in a more complicated case where there's corroboration for the allegation? You could easily decide this either way, but what I would say is that um, I, you can limit this to when allegations are old and that uh, it can be limited to the person who is uh, the complaining witness, all right? Um, and what I would say about that is um, it is interesting to me because in murder investigations, in murder grand juries, a vast number of witnesses are called even for sort of peripheral issues, and there doesn't seem to be a problem with that. I mean, well, are you called talking about Suffolk, are you grand calling, jury. Are you talking about Suffolk County or elsewhere? I'm talking, well, I've had cases in Suffolk and Middlesex counties on murder cases, so that's really my experience. Yeah, right, I mean, I mean the, the constraint here, of course, is that if for some reason the alleged victim that changes her mind or changes her testimony, the Commonwealth doesn't have any grand jury testimony to fall back upon under Commonwealth versus Day. So Correct. it does put the Commonwealth at risk to not put somebody in the grand jury. Uh, is, that, is that not a fair balance that the Commonwealth loses the ability to pull somebody back in when they retreat from their testimony at trial, which I think well, is probably why Suffolk puts a lot of people in the grand jury so that they can invoke Commonwealth versus Day when they right. begin to, 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 to push back from their grand jury testimony. And, and typically there's sort of unique circumstances around that, but what, what I would say is that you know, a dismissal in this case is not the end of this case. It's not as though it can't come back, and I expect that it will come back. Um, and that I have seen many, many cases where after a year and a half or so, and it comes time for an actual trial, it comes time for an actual person to testify, that suddenly there's an enormous reluctance, partly because they don't really know much about the court system, partly because they've decided they're not going through with it. And after everyone's life has essentially <coughs> been ruined, we have dismissals or null process. So what I would say is that I think that if St. Pierre is to have any meaning, and I'm really urging this court to give it some, some strength and some teeth, that in a circumstance like this where the allegations are old, where, uh, you know, where there is no other corroboration, medical or physical or confession, that the witness should be put in front of the grand jury. All right, thank you.